Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our June Grand Rounds. Uh, the topic this morning is Contemporary Approach to Managing ACL Injuries in the Young Athlete. And it was put together by our uh, resident, Ahmad Bayomi, and he has uh, the help of uh, Chris Kwan and Greg Schmally. Uh, Greg, everybody knows, has been taking care of these injuries for years now uh, at, at Seattle Children's. And Chris has uh, come to us about six months ago. He came from private practice uh, at Skagit Hospital, and Chris also has been a go-to person for uh, caring for these injuries uh, before he got here, and we hope he continues to play a role while he's here. Uh, welcome, everybody, who are at our remote sites. I know there are several people at the VA, and I think quite a few people at Harborview. Uh, before we get started, I have uh, several announcements. And I know there is a lot of text here that's uh, very effusive in praising Alan Swenson. Uh, without my reading glasses, that's about as much as you're going to get from me, Alan. Uh, um, what rotation are you on now? So this must have come from Children's Hospital. So anyways, I, uh, joking aside, uh, there is uh, quite a bit here, and it was written by, written by uh, Rainier Akososo, Akoso, you know who that is? And uh, so again, thank you. It sounds like you took great care of uh, a couple of difficult patients uh, in the emergency room at Seattle Children's. Uh, and again, there's quite a bit of praise here for you. So thank you. And then I had uh, one question, does anybody know, I know we don't have Grand Rounds in August, uh, do we have it in July? So we do have it next month, so okay. Uh, we will take a break in August. Uh, so uh, welcome Ahmad, he's going to introduce the topic and we'll save some time. Thank you. Good morning everybody. Again, I'm Ahmed Bayomi. I'm one of the fourth year residents. And today, along with Dr. Chris Kwan and Dr. Greg Schmally, I'll be discussing the contemporary approach to managing ACL injuries in the young athlete. I'd like to start by providing an overview, including the relevant anatomy, uh, evaluation of uh, young athletes with knee injuries, and some of the considerations relating to surgical treatment. Pediatric sports injuries are becoming more common. Uh, estimated at about 2 million per year at the high school level. And this is thought to be related in part to increased participation rates, particularly in cutting sports, higher levels of competition, earlier and year-round focus on specific sports, and uh, students participating in multiple sports concurrently. At the knee, we're seeing an increase in the incidence of ACL ruptures uh, as opposed to tibial spine avulsions which are, were traditionally thought to be the pediatric equivalent of an adult intraarticular tear. Uh, females at particularly increased risk, they have a two and a half greater odds of sustaining an ACL rupture relative to males. And the sports most involved uh, for women are soccer and basketball uh, versus football and basketball in, in, in males. We can group the risk factors for ACL injury uh, into intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Intrinsically, there are some anatomical considerations. It's been shown that patients with increased femoral antiversion, anterior pelvic tilt, uh, and a more acute Q angle, or a decreased intercondylar uh, notch width, these have all been associated with increased risk of tear. And I'll touch on the notch width again shortly. With regard to biomechanics, uh, we've seen over the years that patients who are quad dominant with regard to how much they activate the quadriceps versus the hamstring <coughs> are also at increased risk. And uh, Ahmad and colleagues showed that uh, across uh, uh, skeletal immaturity, moving towards skeletal maturity, girls become increasingly more <coughs> quadriceps dominant relative to boys. There's also thought to be a hormonal component, uh, particularly relating to higher estrogen levels in patients who've had ACL tears. Extrinsic to the patient, we know that footwear, the playing surface that the athlete is on, and the weather conditions can all influence the risk of a tear. Uh, to try to address some of these factors, uh, there's been a push to 
increased neuromuscular or proprioceptive training for athletes with the goal of decreasing the rate of tears. Uh, this has shown some success, particularly in uh, female college athletes. But in a recent meta-analysis, uh, the, the improvement is uh, less significant, and so the jury's still out. In terms of the development of the ACL, starting at the level of the fetus, uh, Gardner was the first to describe the development of the knee after fertilization of the embryo. Uh, at about four weeks, we begin to see a confluence of collagen fibers. And by eight weeks post-fertilization, the ACL fibers have oriented in an adult-like fashion. They're beginning to interdigitate, and they've attached to the epiphyses. <coughs> on the photo on the right, you can actually see in this 20-week-old uh, fetus uh, clearly defined anteromedial and posterolateral bundles. I mentioned the intercondylar notch, and we find that this width plateaus at about age 11. Boys have a wider notch than girls do, and through retrospective review MRIs, we've learned that there's a smaller notch volume in patients who've sustained a tear. The correlation versus causation relating to this is unclear. We know that patients who don't develop an ACL at all have no notch, and so it's unclear whether the notch is a consequence or a predisposing factor. Moving into adolescence, it's interesting to see that the attachment of the ACL on the medial aspect of the lateral femoral condyle stays constant in terms of its distance from the distal femoral physis, which you can see in the photo on the right. It's about three millimeters. Additionally, the lateral intercondylar ridge, which is a landmark that's used for femoral tunnel placement uh, by some practitioners, uh, is more well-defined in adolescence than in children. Much of the controversy surrounding management of these injuries in young patients has to do with the consideration surrounding the physis, and I'd like to just touch on that shortly. The distal femur and proximal tibia bear the fastest growing physis in the leg, accounting for greater than 60% of the length of the limb. On average, the peak height velocity for females is age 11 and a half versus 13 and a half in males. Disruption of as little as four to seven percent of the physeal cross-sectional surface area can result in a clinically significant genuvalgum, uh, tibia recurvatum, or a growth arrest altogether. Uh, uh, fortunately, that cross-sectional area increases with age. So uh, as patients grow older, the impact of, say, reaming across that physis becomes less significant in terms of the area involved. In terms of evaluating the, the athlete who presents with a knee injury, the typical history is for a non-contact valgus force with the knee twisting, popping, and having an acute effusion. It's important to ask patients when appropriate about age at menarche. And it's also important to note that some patients will have a delayed presentation, and they may speak to you about serial or recurrent instability episodes. And shortly I'll mention the clinical relevance of that. As part of a complete musculoskeletal exam, uh, one should assess for physiologic laxity versus signs of syndromic hypermobility, and you can use the Baton criteria shown on the right. Uh, standing, if possible, one should assess the leg alignment and any limb length discrepancy, uh, and make note of these findings as a baseline for any future operative intervention, uh, as well as for a graft selection in a hypermobile patient. Focusing on the knee, not unlike in an adult, you'll see an effusion potentially limited range of motion, a positive Lachman's test, a pivot shift, uh, and it's important to assess for uh, any meniscal or patellofemoral pathology using those maneuvers. Uh, all patients should have a complete knee series uh, when presenting, and in select patients, depending on their age or presentation, you can consider obtaining standing full-length films, as well, as well as a PA of the left hand, uh, which you can reference against uh, the Gerlich pile atlas or one of the shorthand methods to determine the patient's bone age relative to their chronologic age. In terms of obtaining the next study, it's an MRI, and three Tesla magnets are shown to be a bit more sensitive in determining uh, presence of ACL injuries in children. You may see frank discontinuity, as shown in the sagittal view here on the right, or an abnormal course or a change in intensity. 
Uh, notably, in children, we see meniscal tears in up to 70% of those with complete ACL uh, ruptures and chondral lesions in up to 50%. Historically, uh, the recommendation was to delay any ACL reconstruction uh, until the child reaches skeletal maturity, the thought being to avoid any physeal injury. Uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, that the realization became that uh, we'd see poor outcomes with patients who'd had conservative treatment or delay in their management. Um, and in fact, in the series from ACROF, over a 20-year span, the latter half of that study, they began performing transficeal reconstruction. Uh, many of the uh, functional limitations and chondral and meniscal injuries that they'd seen began to decrease. And we do see some findings of degenerative changes on x-ray in those patients. Uh, now, our understanding is that for a patient with an unstable knee and a complete ACL tear, they can have diminished function, significant dropout rates, particularly in high school sports. Some patients present with partial tears, and uh, Coker and colleagues found that to be true for a quarter to a half of children. And a third of those children went on to have unstable knees that then required uh, reconstruction. So in short, Delaying ACL reconstruction in an ACL deficient or unstable knee has been shown to result in poor outcomes, in part because of the rate of meniscal and chondral injuries. Uh, we'll hear more about surgical management today from Dr. Schmali and Dr. Kwan, but I'd like to just touch on the principles. The goal is to restore stability to the knee and protect the joint. The algorithm for doing so has varied based on the patient's uh, age and skeletal maturity. Some advocate for avoiding the physes altogether, both at the distal femur and proximal tibia. Others will cross the physis, but try to minimize the disruption of the cross-sectional surface area using a more vertic vertically oriented uh, uh, tunnel as opposed to an oblique tunnel. Uh, further, you can use a soft graft as opposed to, say, a bone plug across the physis to decrease the risk of a bar. Uh, potentially, a primary ACL repair uh, maybe a treatment in children. It hasn't been borne out in the adult literature, but we're going to learn more about that today. In terms of uh, approaches to avoiding the physis, uh, Coker and McKaylee described the extra physeal approach uh, using the patient's uh, iliotibial band. Uh, this is harvested proximally, wrapped around the lateral femoral condyle, then passed underneath the intermeniscal ligament and secured to the periosteum on the proximal tibia. There are a number of different uh, approaches which provide all the fixation in the epiphyses described by Anderson, Ganley, and Cordasco and Green, which vary in the form of fixation, but are uniform in the goal of avoiding the physis altogether. Finally, transficeal reconstruction is viable. Um, I touched on it shortly, and we'll hear more about that from them, Dr. Schmali. Uh, I'd like to transition over to Dr. Kwan. All right, thanks a lot, Ahmed. That was a really nice introduction and an overview of this topic. Uh, for my part of the talk, I'll uh, review and discuss ACL repair in the setting of treating young athletes with ACL disruptions, all epiphyseal ACL reconstruction technique, and some of the general rehabilitation goals and considerations in patients undergoing ACL reconstruction in the post-operative period. So historically, uh, ACL repair had good outcomes, good early outcomes, but as we tracked them over time, we found that many of the primary repairs of ACL tears became unstable at midterm and, and long-term follow-up. And while there weren't any um, uh, statistical or sophisticated statistical analyses done on the subset of these uh, cohorts of patients, we did uh, see a trend towards better results uh, in kids and in proximal tears after uh, primary repair. Uh, why do primary repairs fail? Well, in contrast to, for example, the MCL or other ligaments that are located extra articularly, um, there's a failure of the ACL to form and maintain that initial hematoma or blood clot that is associated with the uh, inflammatory or initial phase of healing. And the lack or inability to maintain that um, clot 
around the, the tear or injury site prevents the subsequent phases of uh, healing to occur, which ultimately lead in the new formation of collagen fibers. Now that hostile environment where the ACL um, is, uh, lives in, uh, inside the joint, there's probably a, a multifactorial or a number of causes that make it hostile. And uh, some examples of just the presence of synovial fluid, the impaired uh, vascularity of all of the intraarticular structures, and, and perhaps the micromotion or shear forces that the, that the cruciate ligaments see during normal range of motion. However, there are some new developments and, and some emerging technologies that are in the early phases of, uh, of, um, uh, of study. And this is drawn from an article in the New York Times several months ago that's, uh, that got a lot of uh, mainstream publicity that some of you guys may have heard about uh, with research being done on the East Coast using a blood-soaked sponge or scaffold to augment primary repair after acute ACL. Uh, disruptions and they've been following patients out past a year now and, and doing further studies so that's something on the horizon to consider. However, currently um, the primary indication in my opinion for repair of acute ACL injuries is this one. Uh, here you see um, uh, the, uh, the notch, uh, arthroscopic photo, the ACL in the foreground, the PCL behind it, and an empty lateral wall where it's uh, essentially a femoral sided avulsion of the ACL with primarily intact mid-substance or uh, portion or notch portion of the, of the torn ACL. And using contemporary uh, arthroscopic suture passing and fixation techniques, we can take um, the ACL and secure it back onto the native footprint on the lateral femoral condyle. So, uh, in summary, regarding ACL repair, currently it's not the standard of care, uh, uh, even in young patients, as, as the, as the um, go-to approach for acute ACL disruptions. However, femoral-sided ruptures with good tissue in young patients may be more amenable to repair and lead to good outcomes. And everyone should be on the lookout for these emerging technologies that show some early promise and and are in the process of, of sorting out the efficacy and long-term uh, outcome in patients with direct repair using these uh, biologic scaffolds or, or conduits. Moving on to all epiphyseal ACL reconstruction. Uh, the primary indication for this uh, is a patient with moderate to significant growth remaining, but more important than that is really uh, a patient that has an epiphysis in the distal femur that is big enough to accommodate an appropriately sized socket or tunnel, usually in the eight, uh, eight millimeter range. There's some recommendations out there about using 70 pounds as just the, the lower limit uh, of, a, uh, of considering ACL reconstruction in a patient, but again, it really has to do with the size and depth of the epiphysis uh, in the distal femur. Some of the technical considerations when using this uh, method to reconstruct ACLs uh, have some similarities with all of the technical considerations for ACL reconstruction and that um, some examples of that is whether or not to drill full tunnels versus sockets, whether to use inside out drilling techniques versus uh, more classic outside in drilling techniques or more contemporary retro drilling or reaming techniques, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and, and then the, op the general options of fixation for the graphs, including interference fixation, suspension or button fixation, and then metaphyseal fixation. No matter what technique or implant or fixation is utilized, there's one common goal, and that's to create a space for the graft to live within the epiphysis without drilling or traversing the growth plates around the distal femur, proximal tibia, and tibial tubercle. So this is a cartoon depic depiction of outside and drilling with a, a, a what is considered a more adult trajectory to um, create a femoral tunnel uh, at the native uh, footprint or attachment on the lateral femoral condyle. And as we move down to more anatomic and, and, and uh, newer techniques, that trajectory flattens out into where you get to the point in the all epiphyseal technique where the trajectory of the pin and the tunnel 
is essentially parallel to the joint line and the distal femoral epiphysis. The physis is a three-dimensional structure. It's not, just a, it's not just a flat line. And so intraoperatively, we use um, uh, AP and lateral fluoroscopy to um, localize the pin and subsequent tunnel placement. So here we see the, the physis of the distal femur here. Uh, this area, which would be kind of the, the footprint of the uh, ACL on the lateral femoral condyle, and the guide pin situated right there in the center of it. And corresp correspondingly, on the tibial side, the uh, area where the tunnel is going to approach the intraarticular portion in the footprint of the ACL distally, and the tunnel being created and contained all within the epiphysis, avoiding uh, this physis. Uh, and it leads to a construct or a final construct like this where uh, you have the soft tissue graft anatomically placed, all contained within the epiphysis, both in the distal femur and the proximal tibia. And in this construct, fixation achieved with suspension fixation proximally and metaphyseal fixation with uh, screw and post distally. There have been several adaptations to, these, to this all epiphyseal technique to avoid uh, implants in the proximal tibia with smaller split tunnels, to try to maintain inside out drilling using a number of accessory portals or different types of uh, interference fixation um, devices or delivery of those devices. Um, but you know, one, in my opinion, game-changing advance in ACL reconstruction over the last five or 10 years is is this thing, um, these retro drilling or retro reaming or retro cutting devices that start out as a guide pin and once placed can become uh, the appropriately sized reamers. They come in different sizes and so you approach or place the guide pin in a traditional outside in technique but create a socket rather than a tunnel inside out from the joint out towards the cortex. So just some arthroscopic photos uh, outlining this. Uh, here, uh, this came out a little bit dark, but this is the notch, arthroscopic photo of, a photo of the notch. Absent ACL, empty lateral wall, uh, native uh, femoral attachment or footprint of the ACL, and here's the, the rest of the lateral femoral condyle. Intraoperative fluoroscopy showing the, this device or the, the guide pin being drilled, entering into the notch uh, at the footprint. And then uh, the button or the reaming device in being engaged once it's in the anatomic position uh, within the notch or in the lateral femoral condyle. And this then can be used to create here in this instance an eight millimeter socket anatomically placed, reaming from inside out. And uh, the corresponding fluoros fluoroscopic video or uh, images of the tibial tunnel being created in a similar fashion. And, and again, here uh, to reorient the notch here, the native ACL tibial attachment footprint here, the guide pin entering from uh, distally into the joint at the right spot using a guide. And then once it's engaged, uh, a, a socket that can be reamed uh, from the joint side to the cortex side. And then you end up with a, a, a final construct looking something like this where you have sockets all contained within the epiphysis and in this instance, suspension or button fixation for both graphs. Uh, now this, this all inside um, uh, uh, sockets on the femur and tibia uh, reconstruction technique has been performed for several years and the group out at HSS has uh, talked about some early outcomes uh, at our last sports meeting where uh, they looked at the 23 that they've done over the last three or four years and 21 of them or a high number of them have returned to the same level of sport uh, after about a year on average. My preferred combination is uh, retro drilling uh, the socket on the femur side with suspension fixation 
and using standard outside and tibial drilling techniques with metaphyseal fixation for the all epiphyseal uh, techniques. So you have something that's uh, a combination of this on the femur side uh, with a socket and button and this on the tibial side with sutures tied over a screw and post. Uh, rehab considerations in young patients. Well, to contrast, in adults, we have some uh, goals. A period of time to settle down pain, inflammation, and swelling, followed shortly thereafter to try to restore normal, normal range of motion and gait, followed by uh, coordinated efforts to build strength, and then uh, redevelop impact or dynamic strength, which includes running and jogging, uh, before re-engaging in controlled sports type activities uh, and to make sure those are tolerated well before unrestricted or uncontrolled play in sports. How about in young athletes and kids? Pretty much the same thing in pretty much the same order, but there's some variations in practices uh, from sports medicine surgeon to sports medicine surgeon, and they have to do with things such as the use of post-operative braces, uh, when to initiate weight bearing, how much motion restrictions to, to put in place, if, if any, the ratio or the amount of supervised or formal physical therapy versus independent rehabilitation and strengthening, and, and then the use of time as a, a, a method to progress patients to the next phase of therapy versus benchmark or goal-oriented uh, based progression, which Dr. Shamali is going to talk about um, in a few minutes. So. Uh, what's the main difference in younger patients versus adults? There's a compliance issue. Everybody has adult patients that are at risk of not listening or not understanding or not knowing the implications of what they're doing, but that, that, that risk definitely exists in kids. In addition, uh, younger patients are more likely to be surrounded by other people that don't listen or don't understand the implications or the consequences of what they do. And really, to me, the, the biggest difference is that younger patients tend to engage in higher risk activities over a longer period of time. Uh, and, and because of that, my preferred approach for rehabilitation um, after ACL reconstruction in pediatric patients is to move a little bit slower, be a little bit more conservative, whereas I don't routinely use um, post-op braces for isolated ACL reconstruction in adults. I tend to routinely use them in kids. And whereas I may let adult patients after ACL reconstruction start weight bearing after a week or two, depending on swelling and pain, I really try to drag that out with my younger patients. And I leave less room for interpretation, you know, if it, uh, these kind of having nuanced conversations with an adult saying, if you feel this, then you can do that, or if this happens, you may progress to that. There, there's, a, in my opinion, a little bit more risk in taking that type of approach or leaving things to interpretation with younger patients. And so uh, ultimately, there's more supervision, more, more uh, a ratio of more formal therapy versus independent or unsupervised rehabilitation. So um, in, in overview, uh, everyone should keep a lookout on these emerging approaches regarding uh, ACL repair uh, using these biologic um, materials to augment the primary repair, and the, there will be more data regarding this to come out in the near future. All epiphyseal reconstructions are becoming more common in the fixation and uh, tunnel and socket creation uh, techniques, drilling techniques, are, uh, are becoming more reliable. Uh, and patients after ACL reconstruction have the same goals, whether or not they're adult or young, but in young patients, there are more potential pitfalls, and they may require uh, special considerations in the post-operative period. And with that, moving on to Dr. Shmoy. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about two more uh, surgical treatments for ACL tears in the young athlete, and then uh, a readiness for return to sports assessment. So as we've heard, the alternatives are protect the physis, don't do surgery until the child's mature, and that doesn't tend to have very good results, or reconstruct and avoid the physis, and we'll look at one intra extra-articular procedure uh, in just a moment, uh, and we heard about the all-epiphyseal reconstruction. Or you could respect the physis, 
reconstruct by drilling tunnels uh, that cross the physis but place soft tissue grafts and then follow the growth uh, with the thinking that this uh, technique of transficeal reconstruction might give a more anatomic uh, uh, ACL reconstruction. So uh, Lyle McKaylee first described this technique, a modification of the Macintosh procedure, uh, thought to be a way to temporize the pediatric patient who has an ACL tear to get them to maturity so that a reconstruction can be done in a more uh, adult and anatomic manner when they're, when they're done growing. Uh, but they've had good results with this, taking a, a, a band of uh, the central third of the IT band and wrapping that around the lateral femoral condyle passing it under the intermeniscal ligament, and then sewing it to the anteromedial face of uh, the tibia to the periosteum. And the nice addition of this, this procedure is the uh, capacity uh, uh, to um, add uh, as well uh, this tenodesis of the IT band to the posterior aspect of the lateral femoral condyle, which likely recreates that anterolateral ligament that now people are excited about as an element of, the, of uh, many ACL injuries. It's, it's thought to be the cause of the Sagun fracture uh, that you see in, in uh, radiographs of many tears from this lateral capsule or avulsion. Uh, and so this technique may provide some of that additional stability from providing uh, that tenodesis and uh, rotational control here uh, with this uh, band of uh, uh, of tissue extending from Gertie's tubercle up to the posterior lateral uh, femoral condyle. So uh, when first reported uh, in JBJS in 2005, they had a low failure rate, only uh, two of 44, and these were all really skeletally uh, prepubescent patients, very immature, ages four to 14. They saw no substantial growth abnormalities. And more recently, they reported, uh, uh, again, a really low failure rate, less than 3% in the 250 patients that they've done and followed to skeletal maturity. Um, so a lot of pluses to this uh, procedure. Uh, but it, it makes for a quite a horizontal graft. It's not a very anatomic re reconstruction in terms of where the insertion uh, is placed on the tibia for the ACL. You're making a trough uh, to encourage ingrowth since there's no, no tunnel, and that trough's quite close to the apophysis of the proximal tibia, so uh, there is risk of growth arrest from that. A transficeal reconstruction, on the other hand, uh, it just crosses the physis with these tunnels. We try and make them more vertical uh, in most instances and, and centrally located to decrease the forces that might lead to deformity. Uh, we don't provide any fixation across the physis. We use soft tissues uh, and we'll hang the graft once it's placed off the femur with a uh, winged washer and fix it to the tibia with the screw and washer and the metaphysis. But there are risks to this procedure for sure. There's a risk of growth abnormality. The limb could be short or there are reports of long limbs from stimulation of the physis by the drilling of the tunnel. Uh, you can have a crooked limb. It, the leg can bend out. The leg can bend in. The leg can bend forward. These are all growth deformities that have been well documented in animal studies, but uh, uh, the numbers in uh, case series in, uh, uh, in uh, children have been uh, small for these deformities. Uh, so uh, the majority of skeletally immature patients at the UW and at Children's over the past 20 years have been treated with an arthroscopically assisted transficeal ACL reconstruction procedure for the unstable knee. We typically will use hamstring autograft. Uh, uh, we'll do an exam on anesthesia, harvest these two uh, tendons, do a diagnostic arthroscopy, uh, prepare the notch, treat the meniscal tears, and then uh, make the tunnels for passing and fixing the graft. So here's a, an exam under anesthesia, and the markers are on just to highlight some of the differences. So the examiner shows the gross instability of the knee on Lachman's test. A pivot shift shows the rotatory instability, and you want to be gentle when the patient's asleep um, so that you don't cause further injury to the knee with that maneuver. We're going to check the collateral ligaments in nearly full extension, and then in mild knee flexion, check the PCL in about 90 degrees in knee flexion, and there's a good endpoint there. And then with fingers on the menisci, try and feel for any clicking or clunking that might suggest a meniscus pathology. 
then we'll prep and drape the patient and go first to harvesting the hamstrings. And so this is at the pes anserinus. There's a three or four centimeter incision that's made here. And you can see the sartorius aponeurosis has been exposed. And if you run your finger over this, you can feel the bumps of uh, the, the gracilis prominently, the semitendinosus less obviously and more distally. And so we'll make an incision in that aponeurosis and get a metzenbaum under uh, those three uh, uh, tendons at their insertion, elevate them and, and sharply incise them off the tibia. And on the undersurface, you can clearly see here the uh, uh, gracilis and the semitendinosus. And we're gonna separate those from the, from the sartorius uh, and harvest those. And so here we are trying to release some of the many bands that pull uh, uh, and attach the tendon to the calf musculature. You can see the calf jump as we release, release that. Uh, and uh, the point there is to make sure that when we advance the stripper, it follows the main tendon and not one of those little bands. So this is an open-ended tendon stripper. We're gonna put the tendon under full tension as much as we can, and then just slowly wiggle that up into the thigh. And once it's all the way hubbed, we're gonna pull out uh, the tendon with some muscle, and that goes to the back table. We'll harvest the other tendon as well, uh, clear the muscle from that, and prepare that so that once folded over a, a closed loop, uh, uh, we have four strands, uh, and then this winged washer is how we suspend it off the femur, and we fix that to the anterior um, tibia in the metaphyseal region below the physis. Um, so the final construct looks something like this, where the, where the, the growth plate would lie uh, uh, crossing, uh, uh, being crossed by these tunnels. And at times you can look up the, the notch after drilling the femoral tunnel and see the growth plate. So uh, uh, Dr. Kwan and Larson and uh, Dr. Bompadre and I looked at uh, the data from about 10 years of reconstructions at uh, at sports medicine at UW and at Children's from about 1995 to 2005, reconstructions done primarily by Dr. Larson and Dr. Simonian and some by me at Children's and asked the question, do growth abnormalities occur uh, in our group of patients that had transficeal reconstructions? What's the re-injury rate? Uh, how does satisfaction and function correlate to return to sports? And what factors contribute to failure to return to sports? So we found 50 patients that met criteria uh, for skeletal immaturity. 29 who lived locally came back for exams and uh, 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 functional testing uh, and radiographs. And most of those were girls. And uh, most had less than three centimeters of growth left, but a fair number, more than three centimeters, the boys by the majority had more than eight, had uh, more than four centimeters, a mean of eight centimeters of growth left. And most were satisfied with their knees. They had good functional scores, but the re-rupture rate was quite high. And the contralateral ACL rupture rate, so this is a mean of four years after the first reconstruction, was twice the ipsilateral re-rupture rate. So um, the patients, when we graded them in terms of how they felt and what their symptoms were, their exam, the grades turned out uh, pretty well. But in terms of return to sports, it was disappointing that uh, only 40% returned to their prior level of sports at any time after their reconstruction. Uh, those who were highly satisfied with their knee tended to return to sports, but re-injury didn't tend to uh, keep people from returning to sports. It, uh, in those cases where people didn't return, it was mostly a change in interest over time uh, that led to uh, uh, a change in their activity. And so this just showed the drop uh, from uh, pre-injury to uh, their most recent activity level, uh, which was about one level on the Tegner activity score. So this was Dr. one of Dr. Larson's patients. Here he is, 13 years at reconstruction, years of age. Two years after follow-up, uh, he's growing well. His physis are still widely open. Uh, his alignment looks good. Here he is four years postoperatively. The physis are now closed. There's no leg length difference. That's what we see on this film. And the alignment looks good. The mechanical axes are maintained. Uh, so he grew a total of 26 centimeters overall. And so uh, we could identify no angular malalignments in this small group, no early physio closures, but a, a lower than expected return to sports. But this is really supported in the literature in many other studies that it, uh, uh, less than 50% return to sports for the preteen and teenage athletes uh, is not unusual. Uh, 
the re-rupture rates were high. The contralateral rupture rates were even higher, which was surprising. And we found that uh, there was a trend towards failure of the allografts. We only had four allografts, but two of those failed. And so uh, numerous studies in the last few years have supported the notion that allografts not the best tissue for very active patients, for patients who are under 25 years of age, and patients who get back to sports at less than um, six months. So what have we done at Children's over the last 10 years? Um, a lot of ACL reconstructions, probably around 300 in those with open physes. And if we look at those boys who are 12 and under and girls 11 and under, probably 40 or 50 patients will end up identifying. We're looking these up now to see uh, what have we found in terms of uh, growth. Have there been changes? So we've had one reoperation in that time for abnormal growth for tibial varus. Two cases where we identified a loss of posterior tibial slope, probably from an anterior growth arrest of the proximal tibia. But these were uh, subtle and not noticed by the patients, just uh, identified by the examiner in clinic. And the failure rate's probably around 10% uh, or less. Uh, so here is a patient, a seven-year-old. We tried bracing him, but the brace kept ending up around his ankles, and he complained of pain uh, with play. And so we did this reconstruction with a transficeal technique. Uh, and um, over the years, we followed him. Here he is at age 15, just recently, eight years post-op. And the screw's almost halfway uh, to his ankle. And um, I can't get mom to agree to have it removed. And it doesn't bother him. So um, he's maintained a good posterior tibial slope there. Uh, his extension symmetric to the contralateral side. And his alignment looks good. A little bit of leg length difference is no change from pre-op. But here's a guy we saw at age 10 and did a similar procedure for. Here are his early post-op films. Uh, and um, here he is at three months. We get long-standing films at three months. And then we saw him at 12 months. And it looks like he's going into valgus here. Uh, it, he's got a little bit of a knock knee alignment. The space between the ankles is increasing uh, relative to the space between the knees. So let's see him next year. But he didn't come. He came. Uh, uh, three years later, so four years post-op, and now he's in varus of the proximal tibia. So the valgus has resolved in the femur, uh, uh, or maybe it was in the tibia, and now he's definitely in some varus. But his physes are still open, so we did a hemiepiphysiodesis uh, of uh, the uh, lateral proximal uh, tibial physis with a small plate, so growth modulation, and took out a screw and washer at the same time. And he did manage to correct somewhat. He still has uh, a little bit of varus there, but it's, but it's not so much. Uh, and he's in a little bit of varus on the other side as well. So I think hamstring autograph is a reasonable ACL graft, but transficeal reconstructions in the growing patient, they deserve careful monitoring, particularly with those with a lot of growth remaining. So in assessing readiness for return to play, uh, there are physical factors we look at, and we really ought to be looking at the psychological factors, and I think we could be doing a better job at that. In the terms of the physical factors, we look at strength, coordination, agility, and endurance. And then on the, uh, looking at strength, we want to compare the sides and then compare quads to hamstrings on the injured side. Uh, we do hop tests to look at coordination, strength, and agility, a wide balance test, and then a drop landing vertical jump. And so Paterno described this uh, 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 analysis of the drop landing uh, with uh, freeze frame videos and looking at uh, the angle that's made. And this sort of medial thrust, uh, he identified uh, as putting the knee at risk for re-injury uh, or injury. That this sort of alignment, uh, these mechanics are a risk factor uh, for uh, future problems and tears of the ACL. And so. Part of what we do in our rehab programs over at Children's include uh, training patients to land in ways that the legs are more parallel, the thighs are parallel, the feet are evenly placed, the weight is even on the two sides, uh, and that this and uh, uh, strength is adequate to avoid this sort of valgus thrust with, with landing. So here's an athlete that might have benefited from more of that training. So this is a pro day for a well-known athlete. And you can see uh, on the right side a lot of valgus in this maneuver. Uh, and this patient had already had the left ACL reconstructed. Uh, and here they are not much uh, uh, longer from that uh, event at the pro day. They tore their ACL on that right side. So ACL tears are common. Uh, we have rehab and bracing programs, but they not, may not prevent further injury. 
Uh, rehab after surgery may not return the athlete to the pre-injury activity level, and return to sports testing may help decrease the risks of future injury uh, to both knees. We've instituted an ACL injury prevention program on Saturdays at Children's to help decrease that uh, likelihood of uh, contralateral ACL injury that we saw in our prior study because the rates of uh, contralateral injury are so high. Um, so, you know, as practitioners, medical providers, we're all um, confronted with this conundrum. So if you adopt change early, you're going to take on high risk. And if you wait, you're going to be a late adopter. You'll miss the opportunity to treat a lot of patients. And you just have to find the sweet spot for, for you and your patients, the amount of risk that you're willing to, to accept uh, as you adopt uh, new technologies. And, you know, up here in the high-risk early adopters, we have the unfortunate group of capsular shrinkage for shoulder instability and the intraarticular pain pump people. And then, you know, somewhere in here we have trans facial ACL reconstruction and the prepubescent child, you know, which way is this going to go? Is this, uh, is this really worth pursuing? And we're going to look up more of our data to see if it's, if it's a safe procedure. Maybe the facial sparing ACL reconstruction is uh, 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 safer and more effective uh, uh, way to move forward. So um, thank you for your attention, and I hope we have some questions. I just wanted to ask Dr. Kwan, Dr. Smalley, the 11-year-old now playing select soccer who has a mother and an aunt and a father who coaches, what do you tell them after this reconstruction as to how long it's going to be till they really can play again full speed? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we have a rehab program that uh, is a graded advancement of activities, and we'll do uh, return to sports assessment at uh, uh, six months if the child is making... Uh, the regular advancements uh, without instability, pain, swelling. Um, and if they pass our return to sports assessment, we'll slowly advance them over the month to follow. But really, it's 9 to 12 months before they're playing hard, and it's 1 to 2 years before the knee feels right for them. And uh, I don't routinely use braces, but if I have a patient who's hyperflexible, as Ahmed suggested, uh, with uh, you know a bait and score that's five or six or seven out of nine, then I'll brace them afterwards to try and protect the reconstruction. But they often lose their brace and uh, quit playing with it before the end of the time. I'd like them to continue with it, but it's one to two years before the knee feels normal. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, just similarly, I usually. You know, the patients and parents do want to have a number. How long is it going to be before they're back to their year-round soccer or their year-round whatever sport? And uh, I, I kind of give as, a, as an overview or a general timeline of about nine months um, um, for almost all ACLs. Uh, great talk, guys. Um, quick question. I don't know. You know, with, uh, Greg mentioned briefly about anterolateral ligament. Uh, anybody doing anterolateral ligaments or uh, more advanced things, perhaps, such as osteotomies in conjunction with ACL reconstructions, either in the primary or revision settings? Any experience with that? Um, well, for patients with uh, excessive valgus, we've done hemiopisthesis at the same time as ACL reconstruction, uh, a temporary closure of the growth plate to try and improve the alignment with the hopes that that would uh, 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 optimize the recovery and decrease stresses. Uh, you can imagine if a valgus landing force is going to put the knee at risk, then having your knee in valgus all the time is going to increase that risk more. So uh, in terms of reconstructing the anterolateral ligament, we haven't, haven't done that, except it's a freebie with that IT band reconstruction, because as you do that tenodesis, you're basically reconstructing it. Chris, were you doing any? No, I, mean, I haven't had any experience with, with, with that. Yeah. Thank you, guys. That was great. I had a couple of questions. One was about the numbers. So in the beginning, I, I think Ahmed had said that uh, there are, you said, 2 million of these injuries in adolescence a year? 
Two million high school sports injuries per year. Oh, two million sports injuries. And then we have indices of how many of those are knee injuries across different states. Okay. And then you had looked up, I, I saw, Greg, you had, were those, I think, 600, were those all yours primarily? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, are you thinking of writing that experience up? We're writing it up. Okay. Yeah. 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 My other question was, when you look at return to activity, you know, kids that age, I think anybody with young kids knows, their lives are changing quickly at that point. Yeah. And, you know, many of them are, you know, settling into one sport versus, you know, three or four, and some are giving it up altogether. And so do you know how that compares to just natural history of, you know, athletic wow. activity and adolescence uh, versus just the ones with ACL injuries? I'm just wondering if it's not quite as pessimistic as it looks uh, from uh, the data. Yeah, I, I don't know that data, but that's been, that question's been, been raised. Cora Bruner was wondering, gee, I wonder, you know, if you have this number of middle school soccer players, how many high school soccer players do you have? You know, there's only one high school team. There are all these rec middle school yeah. teams. So it's, it's bound to, the numbers are bound to decrease, yeah. It's hard to, hard to know how much that effect has on the actual um, decreased return to play at that same level, though. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks. Nice job. Yeah, thanks. Good work. Yeah, appreciate well it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah.